Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with KLCS in Los Angeles. Today we are chatting with Craig Thompson, Chief Executive Officer of APLA Health. Craig has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Craig, for joining us today. It's great to see you again. APLA Health has gone through such an amazing history in service to communities here in Los Angeles. Talk about the origins of the organization, where you are today, and then let's delve into some of the details. Sure. So actually, APLA Health was founded as AIDS Project Los Angeles in 1983, which to put in a historical perspective was just two years after the virus was even first discovered and identified. So we were one of the first organizations founded to help people living with what we now know of as HIV and AIDS. At that, in those days, we didn't even have a name for the disease. So we began basically as a clearinghouse providing information, what well, little information there was to people, trying to provide accurate information because there was so much fear and stigma at the time. And then we morphed pretty quickly into taking care of people who would rapidly, who were rapidly getting sick and dying around us in an era before there were resources in an era where even the medical community wasn't willing to step in because of fears of um, HIV and AIDS. And this was the community activating and helping itself because there was really, there was so much ignorance, there was yep. so much stigma. The, uh, the healthcare community, uh, some members of that community were wonderful, but the healthcare community as a whole was not. That's right. Uh, and, and so the, the community, the, the LGBTQ community, had to find its own solution and you had to invent yourself. We did, and there was uh, there were no models, and it also, the other thing I think was a real challenge is prior to the AIDS movement, many people in the LGBT community, what we really wanted was to be left alone. So the idea was government, we don't want any, we don't want equal rights, we don't want any rights, we just want you to ignore us, just leave us alone. And then AIDS hit, and we realized that the government had to be a critical partner. So we had to, to engage with a group of people that for many years we had tried not to engage with, particularly at the federal level. That's such an interesting point because having been the target of abuse yep. and having been marginalized, the culture really evolved. I, I had never really thought of it this way. The culture evolved as, as separate with this sensibility of just leave us alone Stop yep. attacking us and, and we'll be happy. And we'll be fine. But now there needed to be a reintegration into all areas of society, services, health care, um, uh, interaction, and actually vocal, vocal advocacy right. out in, in, in a very public way to ensure that there was, a, there was a communal response that went beyond the LGBTQ community. That's right. And I think that's also why we see still to this day that we, we don't have a national aid society like we have a national MS society. We have instead strong local partners. Now some of that's because healthcare is very regional in this country, but also much of it is because initially there was no federal support. So these anchor organizations were founded in Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Chicago, other places with local resources. Usually the local folks were more, uh, more support Supportive. California was obviously more progressive originally than certainly the Reagan administration was, though obviously his former uh, governor of California. So we all got founded and established very strong regional brands before there was an impetus to move together all collectively to work with the federal government. So starting off as, as kind of a guerrilla movement, a guerrilla yep. response, and then having to morph into a public advocacy uh, organization as well as uh, a, an organization that alleviated uh, pain and suffering, provided palliative care, uh, food, and so on and so forth. Let's just fast forward. Let's skip that intervening year and talk about the footprint that you have today and the services that you provide now. Well, I think what's important to realize is that it, as this epidemic has gone along, we've had these major sea changes in the epidemic. And we recognize, obviously, one of them was the introduction of treatment that was successful in the 90s. And then now we're entering a new era, and that's an era where we're really beginning to talk about ending the AIDS epidemic. And we actually have the tools now, we have the technology now. We actually have, I think, have the political will among many communities to really, to really do this. And so we're in this 
this sort of new era. And what I'm most proud about with APLA Health is with a good board of directors and a, and a supportive community, we've been able to migrate and change and, and keep up and hopefully keep ahead of where the epidemic was going by sharing resources, sharing information with our national partners, trying to anticipate where the epidemic was going, making those changes so that we would be ready for our clients and people living with HIV and at risk for HIV. We're going to need next year, three years, five years from now. And the health challenges have significantly changed because initially it was just uh, figuring out a way to, to deal with an end of life issue. That's right. Then it became, uh, particularly for survivors, how do you continue that treatment regimen? And how do you uh, deal with the consequences of a damaging treatment regimen? Then you ended up with uh, more sophisticated uh, drug regimens and then, it, then there were, as people survived longer, there were uh, consequences, health yep. consequences, and now you're dealing with an aging population of people who have lived with AIDS for a really long time, and as people get older, our, all of our needs change. That's and right. there are very specific needs in this community. Talk about those specific needs and how you respond to them. Well, I think we actually have uh, a new, a newish, newer program actually for called Hive, which is HIV Elders, which is actually the term that our focus groups of uh, this is basically in Los Angeles, mostly gay men, mostly over 50, many over 60, and the, the numbers are staggering. I mean, in the first epidemic cities, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, those cities that were fir hit first, more than 50 percent of the people living with HIV in in our cities are over 50 years old, and and that is an aging co cohort. Now that's great news because what that means is new infections have dropped so significantly and deaths have dropped so significant that the whole cohort is aging. But as you mentioned, what happens is that they're, they're aging with HIV and they're aging, many of them are aging with HIV slash AIDS. So some of these folks are people that didn't succeed on the regimens. We mistreated, we didn't know any better, we, but we prescribed medications in much higher doses than we knew. And these are people who, many of whom went out on an HIV or an AIDS disability 15, 20, 25 years ago. So a lot of what we're dealing with now is a group of people that's aging, the consequences of long-term treatment, also just the consequences of being 60, 70, 80. Right. They're almost all single. They're long before the gay marriage era and certainly long before the gay marriage having children. They have classic PTSD from having lost 25 to 50 percent of their peer group to AIDS. Not only losing those folks but going through the consequences of burying them the whole time living with HIV and wondering when they were going to be next. Well also very often because of the nature of, of that experience one is a caregiver as well as a patient. Yep. So you go through this whole arc of, of uh, sort of a double trauma. And then I, uh, compounding this, the majority of those folks, at least the majority of the folks that we see, are living on a government SSI or SSDI check. Right. So they're living on $871 a month, maybe $1,100 on the high end in Los Angeles. Because their income streams were disrupted at a young age. That's right. And, 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 and that creates a whole other issue for society. Right. So, so many of the programs that we've developed over the years for these folks are really poverty-based. Food, transportation, housing support, mental health support, obviously critical. But now what we're also doing, in addition to looking at the medical challenges of geriatric medicine for people with HIV, we're also looking at more and more we talk to folks who say, I haven't left the house in two weeks. Right. I, I have no social outlets, I have no money, I have I, no car, I have no friends, I have no friends, and I'm deeply stigmatized by living with HIV and aging in the gay community. And we are not the kindest community, we really are a community that glorifies young and vibrant, and we tend to ignore our elders, it's a, it's a real challenge in the gay community. Exacerbate that, compound that by the fact that these are people many of whom are obviously living with HIV or AIDS. And so they feel old, they feel isolated, they feel ignored, they feel stigmatized, they're poor, they're housebound, and their health is failing after many, many years of, of holding their own against HIV and AIDS. And this is where you have to evolve your own response. So you, you go from being um, a, sort of a medically-based 
uh, organization, medical in a very uh, narrow sense, a condition that has a, an end date where, um, where death comes reasonably quickly, to an organization that now provides, you, you're an, uh, an FQHC, yep. um, you provide uh, physical health, mental health, you provide uh, dental, uh, you provide vision, you are uh, providing uh, food, yes. uh, meals for people, um, you are dealing with trauma, uh, you're dealing with all sorts of different services, not only alone, but also in partnership with, with government, with, with other nonprofits. It's a very, very sophisticated operation and your management structure has had to also evolve your competencies of your team have had to evolve that's right. considerably. And I think that's, I would say that has been the biggest challenge. And I would say also the board of directors has had to evolve right. and people's thinking and, and maneuvering board members, recruiting new board members who could think in a new and a broader way has been a challenge. It's hard, the other thing about this is you know we have business units, right. some of which have grown very rapidly, some of which are slow growing. The, the, it becomes hard, difficult to motivate folks, to encourage people, to reward people when they feel like I'm in one of those units that's not, I'm not the leading edge anymore. I'm not the cutting edge. But they may, it's important, it's really critical work, but it's not where the growth and the future of the agency may, may be. So it's a little like the classic sort of corporate structure where you have, you know, you can sort of de designate your business units into cash cows and rising stars and all those things. That's been a real challenge from organizations that basically started out doing one thing, one thing very well, and it, that thing was very broad, to now multifaceted. We have entire programs for adolescents, right, at risk for HIV, health care for them, and then we have HIV and aging programs for the, the gay man over 60 who's been living with HIV for 35 years. A mission that is so important, a set of services that really only APLA Health at this point in time is positioned to provide and to, to evolve your scale and evolve your people and evolve your programs to remain current. Craig Thompson, thank you so much for sharing the lessons from APLA Health, which are very applicable across many diverse fields. Thank you so much for being the person you are, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.